Major funding for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Okay, so here we are past the fiscal cliff and past the 2012 election cycle. And in North Carolina, at least, the influence of Republicans is at a high watermark. In addition, the influence of Charlotte lawmakers in politics is also historically unparalleled. Welcome back to the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William, and this time it's more than just politics. But if the public policy landscape unfolds the way the North Carolina GOP would like, it will mean a broadly secular change in the state's tax structure, a change in its DNA, if you will. Joining us later in the dialogue from North Carolina Senate District 39 and the point of the spear of this effort, Dr. Bob Rucho. Major funding also by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded January 25th, 2013. On this week's program, Tim Boyum of News 14 Carolina, Dr. Adolphus Belk Jr. of Winthrop University, and special guest, North Carolina Senator Robert Rucho. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome again to our program. Uh, Tim Adolphus, good to have you both here. Thanks for having me. And I want to make a particular note because we, we are producing this program on the day of the rain and the sleet and the, <laughs> and the dangerous conditions. But uh, thank you for making the, the trip from Raleigh and from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Winthrop. Uh, okay, Tim, I start with you. Uh, here we got in Raleigh, we've got uh, new management. Got Republicans in charge. Give us a sense of the mood in Raleigh now. And, and I mean, ju not just with the GOP, but with the Democrats. So with the Republicans, they, they are, are ready to get started. They, uh, as early as the middle of last year, they, they were confident they were going to win the, the governor's office uh, and even pick up seats in the House and Senate, which they did. So I think there's been a motivation to just get to work and get forward on some of these tough issues that are going to take some time, like tax policy, uh, unemployment insurance, and the budget, and regulation reform, regulatory reform, which is going to take a lot. So I think there's a sense of, of let's get to work. They're very confident. Um, I, I don't think you would call it arrogant, but they believe what they're doing is right and they're ready to move forward. The Democrats, I think there's an identity crisis. You know, they've had this issue with the state party chair in North Carolina for some time. There's no really one person you go to, like the, the days of Jim Hunt, and, that, and say, okay, that's, the, that's who's leading the Democrat and their policy. They're shifting to a, a mood of responding uh, and figuring their role in the legislature and if they're going to have a say. You, you get the sense... You get the sense that Republicans are going to reach across the aisle and not and not just push through what they want to get done. But is there some kind of, you know, relationship there between the parties that maybe wasn't there a year or two ago? I think on, on some bills you'll see that on the major bills I don't because there's just such big disagreement on on tax reform and issues like that. There may be some small pieces here and there, but when push comes to shove, Republicans have been waiting for this moment and they're going to do what they want to do. You know, Adolphus, you know this. Everybody likes to think that their leaders are going in the right direction. They want to follow the right people, the right men, the right women. Uh, Nikki Haley, South Carolina governor, has stated the state address uh, about a week ago now. Um, has has softened her tone to some degree, not just with those in the other party from her, but also with those of hers in her party. Do you get the sense that there's some kind of olive branch now with Nikki Haley in the state house? I think some of it is a matter of necessity, given that this is a different person than entered the General Assembly two years ago to give a, a, an address. 
Two years ago, she comes in with rock star status, having ascended from a very crowded Republican field with endorsements from people like Mitt Romney, who was emerging as a leader within the GOP, and from Tea Party favorite Sarah Palin. Now, she's someone who has a, an approval rating that's kind of mixed about as many as many South Carolinians, according to the Winther poll, disapprove of the job she's doing as governor than approve, though the results were within the, the margin of error. There are a greater number of people who believe that the state is heading in the right direction, but they don't necessarily credit her for it. So she's in a position where um, she has to moderate a, a bit in dealing with a party that she's going to need to accomplish her agenda, and an agenda is somewhat expansive. Do you, th do you think she's poll sensitive? Does she look at these things and... I mean, not, not, not necessarily fi find which way the wind's blowing and go that way, but you think she reads these and responds to these? I think the governor is well aware of her numbers. I don't think that it's something that's going to drive her agenda or transform her agenda, but I think she's aware of it. And if you look at the talk that was laid out, she has, she's in a position now where she's getting ready to run in two years. And if she's going to do that, she has to be able to point to a record of achievement. And this is someone that came into that talk, the, the State of the State Address, having won some victories, but also suffered some setbacks. You look at what happened at the Department of Revenue, and it was the greatest hack in the history of the United States for a state agency of its size. And that's a, a dark mark for the state. In addition, even though the governor noted that the unemployment rate was at its lowest point in four years. We still have an unemployment rate that's higher than the United States on average. We have a poverty rate that's higher than the United States on average. And there's been a, a deal of, of, of food insecurity in the state where about a, a quarter of the population, or well, really a, a, a fifth of the population is fearful of running out of food before they have an opportunity to buy more. So those are some real problems yeah. that the governor faces, and she knows it. And so she needs to work with this assembly to get something done about it. Well, one of the things that our guest is going to speak right to this, but is tax reform. And, you know, South Carolina has been talking about tax reform for a long time. And North Carolina has too, but <laughs> North Carolina seems to have at least some momentum now and seems like they could bring together the numbers to do that. Uh, how, how, you know, let's handicap this a little bit, Tim. Uh, do you think the Republicans can get the tax reform done as it's being laid out now? You know, I just talked to Speaker Tillis about this this week, and, and he questioned out loud how you unwind 50 years of tax code and tax policy in a matter of five months. They want to be out of here by early June at the latest. So it's, it's a good question. I think you're seeing, you know, the one side where you completely get rid of those uh, personal income tax, the corporate in income tax, and the business franchise tax. And you have another side that's more cautious that's saying, let's do it over time and just get them closer to the southeast average. My guess is they'll probably get somewhere in between. You know, one of the things you, you yeah. get into is exemptions, too. Do you do some or do you do all? And, uh, you know, it's a slippery slope when you start getting into those, that context. You, you get, you, you're getting any traction in South Carolina? Do you see anything, Adolphus? Well, the, the governor's talked about eliminating the 6% tax rate, and here's the, the, the issue. That sounds good, but... Taxes, we, we have a long history in this country, and in the Carolinas in particular, of having a disdain for taxes. But at the same time, there's an insatiable appetite on the part of citizens for all the things that can be delivered with tax dollars. A majority of the money is going to be spent in two areas, K through 12 education and university education and healthcare services. And so if you want education, if you want health, if you want mental health services, if you want transportation, maintenance of roads and bridges, the development of technology infrastructure, these things don't magically appear out of the ether. They're not part of the natural environment. They appear as a result of our tax dollars. But what, what happens during moments of economic contraction, like the recession out of which we've recently emerged, people become much more focused on how the money is being spent. They're rightfully frustrated when they hear that their dollars are being wasted or used in ways that are inefficient, and they become much more leery of programs that they think are helping people who are undeserving of the benefits. But change is scary, and, and income taxes are over half the budget in North Carolina. So to b feel certain that this new plan is going to fill that hole is scaring a lot of people. And, w and we get the point, man, on that in, in just a second, uh, just about, in about 20 seconds. Uh, former Congressman, freshman Senator Tim Scott, good for South Carolina? I think it's good for descriptive representation. And, and part of the problem, though, is when you lose someone like Jim DeMint, you lose someone that had a considerable degree of influence within the chamber, and it's going to be tough for Scott to build that up in a short period. You think he has the DNA to do it? 
He's someone that has demonstrated he's he's ready to fight, and that's going to serve him well when he moves to the Senate, but it's a different body. Okay, that'll be the final word. We'll bring our guest in a second. Uh, mark your calendars for this. This is a very special program, and I'll tell you who's going to be on this program and then tell you a little bit about it. Uh, South Carolina Superintendent of Education, Dr. McZace, uh, Orangeburg County Representative Gilda Cobb-Hunter, uh, Superintendent of Schools in Darlington County, as well as South Carolina Superintendent of the Year, Dr. Rainey Knight, and of course, I love her name. She gets that all the time. Uh, bb and President Mike Brennan, who's also on the South Carolina Education Board, and uh, South Carolina Future Minds Exec, Trip Dubard, on uh, February 19th in Columbia at ETV, we are hosting the Carolina Business Review Education Summit. It will be a a, not a live broadcast, but we will have a reception. We'd like you to join us if you want to find out more about it or watch that show online. Go to carolinabusinessreview.com. North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory characterized the Tar Heel State's current tax code as reflective of a 1930s era manufacturing economy. North Carolina Speaker of the House Tom Tillis said that there is no question about lawmakers taking on tax reform. And North Carolina Senator and co-chair of the Senate Finance Committee, Bob Rucho, is selling a broad plan that he says will make North Carolina tax system simpler, more transparent, encouraging to business growth, and less volatile. Joining us now is Senator Bob Rucho. Welcome to the program. Good to be with you, Chris. Uh, Senator, you know, I almost don't know where to start with this one. This is such a big issue. What have you heard as you're out on the road, as you're talking to people about, and this is real tax reform. Um, I, I don't think, that, you know, this is not going to be, I mean, this is changing the DNA. What are you hearing from business? What are you hearing from nonprofits? Well, I, I think the message that we've been giving them and, and how they've responded has been positive in the sense that, you know, we studied this issue from for the last six to eight months and, and what we culled it down to was basically we're seeing a, a significant decrease in whether you're talking about per capita average income, net household income, we're seeing poverty rates rise, we're seeing an eroding sales tax base, and the thing that really uh, upsets a lot of folks is we, have, we, we evaluate our economy and our tax policy is we're ranked number fifth as far as the highest unemployment in the country. All of those factors are negative, and I think the the message that we get from the citizens and the businesses that we speak with is, hey, we need to do something. We need to fix it because our ultimate goal is having an opportunity for prosperity, economic growth, and job creation. And job creation is really key to this. This is why we got elected. And what now is the time we have to uh, deliver on a promise. You know, and I know you've seen this. We've all seen this. Art Pope now, the, the, the new governor's budget chief is in here saying that this is absolutely, he's not even being coy about it saying it's absolutely regressive and it's going to hurt those that that pay a least amount of tax. So if you've got somebody in the, the newly minted management in the executive branch here saying that, how, how does that work against what you're trying to do? Well, I, and I have a lot of respect for Art Pope and he's a very knowledgeable uh, businessman. Um, I think that he uh, probably uh, misstated some uh, some parts of this. I think the governor made it very clear in a recent response after that that uh, he is fully on board with making sure that we do something that is in a comprehensive in, uh, in nature. There have been seven other groups back to 1951 that have tried to fix this problem. I believe now we have the leadership and the political will and actually um, uh, the political will to, to make meaningful and comprehensive changes, the ones that will make a difference on the people's lives in the future. And uh, that offers opportunity and hope. And this is something that, that we believe uh, can be moved forward. Do, do you think our Pope speaks for Pat McCrory? Uh, well, I don't believe so, because I think Pat McCrory is very clear that he is in the process of evaluating all the options, measuring what we can and can't do. Um, you know, this is a combination of the governor helping with this, the House and the Senate. It has to be done in a combined effort. Um, we have to get, uh, you know, is everybody going to be happy? No. There have been businesses out there and uh, people out there that have had tax preferences for many, many years. And those tax preferences cost money. And that means everybody else pays for those ones that get tax preferences. Our plan is to be simple, fair, and uh, be a pro-growth uh, economic plan that has great po uh, possibilities of the future, even to the point of uh, pressing South Carolina in the competitive manner. Tim. <laughs> 
How, how can you be, you know, we, I talked to Speaker Tillis, as I mentioned, uh, but he's, there is some concern about, you know, pushing back the system completely. Why not just roll back the rates to, to the southeast average and, and incrementally do it over time versus just going straight to zero? You know, that may be a reality, but, it, but you need to have a vision of where you want to go. You need to have a plan that will deliver um, the proper taxes, uh, tax policy that will create economic growth, not be a detriment to it. Now, a lot of folks have studied, we've, we've talked with many economists in the state and studied this issue very thoroughly. And as we've studied it, we learned that there are good taxes and bad taxes. Income taxes are not only volatile, but they are critically against economic growth and jobs. Why would you keep something that is, that is against what your goal is? As related to a consumption-based tax, uh, which is a very big driver on economic growth, what you have there is every time a transaction occurs, something is bought or sold, business activity is created. So in essence, what you're doing is you're using money to create money, and that provides some good stability in the revenue stream of the government, but more importantly, there's a huge economic effect that will occur because of that, and that means more economic growth and jobs, and that's what we're intended to deliver. The, under your plan, I think the, the sales tax goes to 8.05%, if I'm not mistaken. The, the, the liberal progressive groups will say that that's more regressive and will hurt the poor, and the, the rich or the wealthy will benefit more. I mean, how, how do you help those folks that may be more adversely affected because they spend a more larger percentage of their income on, on goods? Well, if you look at the fact that we've had a decline over the last 10 years of income, both uh, per capita and uh, household, net household income, you've seen an increase in poverty. Poverty. How, why would you continue using a system that has delivered that kind of result? What we're offering is an alternative, something that, you know, they talk about regressivity, but in reality, the present system is regressive. Otherwise, we wouldn't have all those folks locked in poverty. We're offering an opportunity to be able to climb the economic ladder with the proper jobs. That is critical. If the best way out of poverty is, is employment, and right now we don't have that. We've not kept pace despite spending $6.7 billion in incentive programs to create long-term jobs. We netted 61,000 jobs. It was the wrong pathway, and we're correcting those problems. But in the meantime, you have to be uh, doing, accomplishing this on a, on a full, comprehensive basis. You need to have economic drivers, and we believe a, a full consumption-based tax eliminating over time, if necessary, the incomes, both corporate and personal, and the franchise tax for that matter. And what that does is it will stimulate the economy and allow us to have a prosperous opportunity for the future. Um, I, wanna, I wanna speak to this point about the, the consumption tax. Um, part of the issue with sales taxes is that they are volatile. Um, and if you open up something like a consumption tax, you're opening yourself up to the possibility that during periods of contraction, the, the dollars might dry up while at the same time the demand for services is still going to be there. So with that said, what is it about this plan that's going to put you in a better position to deal with the volatility of being exposed to natural cycles of expansion and contraction in, in the business cycle? It's a great question. But what I'll say to you is the studies that we've looked at, income taxes are significantly more volatile, even to the point of three, uh, four or five times more than a sales tax base. The other part that makes this very successful is you've broadened it beyond what, a, what it is originally proposed in 1930 was ta ta sales tax on tangible items, broadening it to a full sales tax base. And what that does is by broadening that base, you increase the diverse uh, experiences of the entire economy where you may have ups and downs, but you've diversified that kind of movement. And what we anticipate, even during the very worst times, which we're presently experiencing, and I'm hoping at some point we get out of this recession, I'm not sure we've done it up to this moment, we see less than an 8% up or down volatility as compared to significant uh, changes in income tax. So we believe this is a far better way of going, especially if you can broaden that tax into service areas. And you know, our research has shown that we've seen a significant change in consumer spending. Household income, uh, households are spending more on services and none of it is being, or rarely any of it is being taxed within the system. What we're saying is you put more money in people's pockets, that disposable income can be used on buying goods and services, or it can be saved and invested. And that, both of which, whether you save and invest to be able to have uh, additional capital for mortgages and loans, or more importantly, every single time a trans transaction takes place, you are creating business activity, which leads to income 
and growth as far as economic growth and ultimately jobs. So we believe it's the best path for uh, a prosperous North Carolina. I guess part of my concerns are twofold. Uh, first, there's this issue of looking at the impact of the Great Recession. And though, although technically the recession ended in June of 2009, we're still dealing with the lingering effects. States are in a position where, unless you're Vermont, you can't pass a, bu pass a budget that's not balanced. And this means that people have to be mindful of how the budgets are going to be created and how they're going to balance spending and the revenue that's coming in. Now, with that said, when I think about states like North and South Carolina, they were experiencing great difficulty budget-wise before the Great Recession, and that deepened people's sufferings with higher levels of poverty, higher levels of unemployment, longer bouts on unemployment insurance. And so I guess part of my question is, how would the proposed tax deal with the revenue issue when it's a revenue problem, but it's also a spending problem? Well, it is. And, and of course, spending is something that we're trying to maintain control over, as we've done from the first day in January of 2011 when we took over and we turned a $2.7 billion deficit into $230 million surplus by making some tough decisions, but being conscious about education, the welfare, social uh, safety net system and transportation. But the critical factor is you have to be able to put together a system that is non-volatile. The existing system is not sustainable and really isn't even an option anymore. And if you don't go after and change the fundamental underpinnings, which is eroding our economy, then very simply, you're never going to achieve the changes you want to. That also means getting people out of poverty. This offers them a road and a pathway where you're eliminating the barriers and the glass ceilings for them to climb that economic ladder with more rungs on the ladder by having more job opportunities. Okay. Right now, okay. we're, we don't have that. Okay, because well, uh, we spent a lot of time on this volatility. Just, just, just very quickly and last on this, and I'm going to move on because we've got about three minutes left. Uh, you know, somebody else has done it. North Carolina's not a trailblazer here. You got Tennessee, you got Florida. I mean, how are these other states, how have they done with their, their volatility year over year on revenue? Well, because of the fact that they were able to, and again, in, te in Texas, for example, they've got a 6.2% unemployment rate, which is almost three points less than we are. Of course, they have uh, you know, natural resources like oil and the gas, but the fact that that revenue stream that they get isn't as volatile. Right now, North Carolina, 20% of all of our revenue comes from the income tax, and that is the most volatile revenue stream, especially what happens is during the good times, you have a billion or $2 billion surplus. And the legislatures in the past spent every penny of it. Then when we have the decline, all of a sudden we have a $2 billion deficit and we have to find a way. And the only way has been to increase taxes because they've been reluctant to cut spending. So by controlling volatility in that manner and recognizing what the real cause of the problem of the volatility is, you can actually solve this problem and get put back on the proper pathway so you can expect sound and stable economic growth from what is a very simple system uh, as far as uh, tax policy. Uh, we've got two minutes left, Mr. Chairman. And, and, okay, so let's say that you spend, and you are, spending a lot of time on the road with this idea. How, how do you make sure here, Senator, that, that Republicans don't get so myopically invested in this that some of the other priorities fall off the table? Education, under, uh, you know, unemployment insurance. I mean, how do you make sure that you don't you're not going down that road and you miss a whole bunch of bullets that you're supposed Chris, to get. Chris, it's a great question, but here's the secret. We're, our goal is not just tax policy. The, the five points to a competitive economy is education, transportation, mm -hmm. energy, regulatory reform, and then tax policy. All of those five factors have to be addressed, which we are addressing. We can do more than one thing at a time. So we're trying to manage all of those examples. Senator Berger introduced the Excellence Education Act, which preparing our, our folks for uh, the 21st century jobs. Reg reform was a critical factor for us and will continue. We made great strides in energy, especially in shale gas and energy independence. Transportation, we need to be, be able to move people and goods, not just across North Carolina, but across the globe. Now that we have our financial house under control, this is a great opportunity for us to take on the tax policy, which is a 1930 era policy that is failing us and no longer able to meet the needs of a 21st century state like North Carolina. Uh, we have 30 seconds. Just very quickly, do you feel like the, the Republicans can get this done in 2013? We are working across the aisle. I've already extended out uh, opportunities for uh, Senator Claude Felter, uh, Senator Walters, uh, 
Senator Jenkins, uh, who were chief finance people in the okay. Senate and the Democrat side, to help us with this, along with on the House side. Okay, Senator, thank you for being on the program. I suspect we'll probably have you back as this thing unfolds. Adolphus, uh, nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Good My pleasure. You. Tim, be careful. Nice to see you, too. Nice. Thank, thank you. you so much. Appreciate Until it. Until next week, I'm Chris William. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.